welcome everyone. I'm so glad to have you here. I'm Kiri Silverstock and we're really excited to start this special webinar tonight about graduate school and law school and our panel is going to tell you everything you need to know and ever wondered about applying to and getting into graduate school and law school. So I want to take a minute and give you a quick round of introduction. So Sabrina, if you can wave hello. <laughs> Some of you may recognize Sabrina because she just graduated from Principia College and she's a first year student in the Master of Global Affairs program at the University of Toronto. She completed her undergraduate degree in spring of 2020 at Principia College in Global Studies with a specialization in sustainable development and minored in business. As an undergrad, she was also director of the operations for Principia College's Public Affairs Conference, PAC, titled Engage with Information, Reimagine Discourse. In summer 2019, Sabrina went abroad to Slovenia, Croatia, and Bosnia, and then spent the last two months being an au pair in France. And we're also really excited to have with us Professor Bobby McAdoo. <laughs> Welcome. So Professor Bobby McAdoo graduated with honors from Principia College in 1970 and from the National Law Center, George Washington University, Order of the Coif, in 1979. She is a faculty on the Hanlon University School of Law for 28 years after almost 10 years working for the Department of Health, Education and Welfare in Washington, DC, and five years of labor and employment legal practice at the Dorsey and Whitney Law Firm in Minneapolis. At the law school and besides teaching and research, she provided negotiation and mediation skills training for lawyers and judges in the US and abroad and actively participated in alternative dispute resolution program planning for state, civil, and family district and appellate courts. She was also the executive director of the Mediation Center for four years while on the law faculty. Professor McAdoo is now Emeritus Professor at the Mitchell Hamlin University School of Law, and we're so excited to have her with us tonight. Thank you. And I'm sure it will, hopefully you all recognize Dr. Megan Madden, <laughs> although she works a lot of hours. So unless you head over to Claire McNabb, maybe you haven't seen her for a while, but uh, Dr. Megan Madden is our Dean of Academics. And what you may not know about Dr. Madden is before coming to Principia College, she's actually sat in many um, admissions committees uh, for undergrad and graduate students and brings a unique perspective. She also got her BA at Principia College and then went on to get her MA and PhD in Higher Education and Comparative International and Development Education at the University of Toronto. Her research agenda examines higher education policy frameworks and how policy impacts student experiences within the context of international higher education for development and exchange. As a chief academic officer for Principia College, Dr. Madden is responsible for the overall administration, coordination, and development of academic policies, programs, personnel, and facilities. Dr. Madden continues to sit on the doctoral dissertation committees at George Washington University. And an interesting fact, a couple interesting facts, um, Dr. Madden served a three-year term as co-chair of the largest special interest group of the Comparative and International Education Society the Higher Education Special Interest Group, otherwise known as HESIG. And in this role, she served as executive editor for the Journal of Comparative and Inter International Higher Education. Also, while at George Washington University, Dr. Madden served as co-chair of the UNESCO Chair in International Education for Development. So we have a wonderful panel here, and we had a conversation before tonight, and I can't wait for you all to hear from our panelists and um, please feel free to put your questions um, in the in the chat room or in the Q&A and we will be getting to those um, in a little bit. But I want to kick this off and uh, starting with Sabrina and everyone will kind of share their perspective, but how should students even know? I mean, we have a lot of students that have told me I'm thinking about graduate school, I'm thinking about law school, but how, how do you really know if you should even consider it? Yeah, that's a great question. Okay, so I started thinking about possibly going to grad school my junior year, but didn't heavily consider it until the fall of my senior year, actually, because I knew I wanted to do something with diplomacy and think about like what I exactly want to do in that career and likewise. And so following my undergrad education, so I went back and forth between the two, just like, should I do more school? Should I not? 
Um, and I did a lot of research into diplomacy and I did a lot of research into like graduate schools and different programs that they have. And I realized the benefits that I would have entering into the career field, having had my master's degree and having had the extra education. I did a lot of research and I found that like I would be more competitive in an industry that's like harder to get into with diplomacy and being there. And then I also found that I would gain more knowledge studying specifically like one or two years. A lot of the master's programs depends um, in that specific field opposed to just like not necessarily doing my gen eds like I did in my undergrad degree. And I knew that it's something that would be tough and something that it would not always be fun, but something that I was definitely willing to take on and try as a challenge. And I, it's something that I'm very much experiencing because it's only my second week in the program. But <laughs> um, that's a little bit of why I would cons why I consider graduate school. <laughs> Do you want us to just jump in, Carrie? Yeah, go right ahead. Thank you. Well, I, I mean, I think what's really impressive about the way Sabrina just answered that question is the number of times that she said, I did a lot of research or I, I really did my homework to decide what direction I thought I wanted to go in. And I, I think that's pretty critical as you try to think about just what your larger purpose may be after you leave Principia College. What, what is it that you're uniquely hoping to achieve? And that doesn't mean that you have to get into one thing and be locked for the whole rest of your life but you certainly have to make some decisions going into kind of mm -hmm. that maybe first decade of your life graduate school is in law school I, I, I guess I obviously can speak more to law school but I, there's so many things that one can do with a law degree um, it, that it sometimes I feel like our very complicated regulated life <laughs> means that everybody needs to have a law degree no matter what else other degree they have Obviously, that's um, too extreme, but I, I think you really need to, to think a lot about what, what really excites you when, if, is it, for instance, if, it, if you really love to do problem solving all the time, you know, that might lead you towards a law possibility. And then do your research, as Sabrina said, and mm -hmm. I would include in terms of law school, talk to a bunch of lawyers. You know, all those TV shows, mm, that's not really what lawyers do. <laughs> lawyers read a lot and write a lot. Um, and so you really want to be sure that there's a fit as you're trying to decide not only go to law school but, or, or grad school, not only go to graduate school, but what kind of program is, is going to be the most appropriate for you. That's great. <laughs> And I'll pick up on that in terms of tra trying to figure out what the most appropriate um, program is for you. It doesn't have to be the top school, right? It has to be the school that offers the specialty that you're interested in. No, it just so happens that Sabrina is at the top school. <laughs> and, <You're right. laughs> and so she, you know, she's done really well for her. It's good at the Monk School that has a really fabulous reputation ac around the world. And so, but that, you know, your focus really should be um, what are my interests? Who are the people that I would like to study with? And and then um, and then and and then also just doing the research to find out are they okay with people who come straight out of undergrad, or is there a preference for working before you go um, to graduate school? And uh, and because if you decide to go straight into graduate school, you'll need to realize that you're competing with people who already have work experience. And in graduate school, work experience is important, um, not totally necessary. And so uh, it, it just depends on how compelling your, your um, letter of intent is and how well written it is. Yeah, that's really important. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, Sabrina, I kind of one of the next questions we want to get at is advice for people who are starting to apply. And you had such an interesting story. And I do want to point out, I mean, like Dr. Megan Madden said, you got into the one of the top schools in the world, basically. <laughs> so I think your journey was really interesting. And I think you weren't even aware of that, right, in the beginning when you started to talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was actually so funny because um, my parents are from Canada and so I knew that I wanted to like 
maybe go back home potentially for school in Toronto. And I did a, like a lot of research about the schools there and I found University of Toronto and I was like, this looks like a great program. The Hmong school, like everything I want in a program, it has the internship in the middle. It has that like professional development workshops to help me get that job after my master's degree because I didn't want to get a PhD. And so that's also, I'll tie this in my advice, but to reach out, like I reached out to profs and directors of the program and I was like, hi, my name's Sabrina. I'm at this really small school in Elsa, Illinois, but I am really interested in studying diplomacy and this is what I want to do. And I kind of like later, I was like, what are you looking for? Because I know, I knew going in kind of what Dr. Mann was saying, I was at a disadvantage. Even on the first web page, they had actually said like, we don't really consider um, people who come right from undergrad. Like we really, really want that work experience. And I was like, oh my goodness. But I was like, you know what? I'll just apply anyway, we'll see what happens. Um, and I ended up getting in because they actually said they remembered me when the application came through. They actually remembered that I had talked to them and talked to the professors. Um, my other two pieces of advice, I guess I'll tie them in my story, was to start early give your professors time to write those letter of recommendations and give yourself that time to write your statement of interest to get your resume flushed out and done and read over, like read over your statement so many times and have other people read over it too. And then Dr. Madden was also saying this, but explore your options, like look at all sorts of different programs and see which one you feel benefit you the best. Like name schools are great, but there are so many great options out there as well for every individual. That's really great. I would speak to the um, name school that Sabrina just mentioned because I went to a name school, um, but my career for teaching for so many years since I had moved to Minnesota for a huge law firm after I graduated from my name school at, at GW, um, it, I can admit that it's actually very unlikely that I would have had the wonderful career that I had teaching at a law school if I hadn't gone to George Washington University. So this once again, even though you might not know initially, there, there is some connection between probably that name school and what your ultimate um, career options might be. Teaching, being a law professor is somewhat unlikely. It, if I hadn't gone to a name school, on the other hand, um, I had an incredibly wonderful career at um, a law school that would not have been considered a name school. It's a school that is just fabulous, and they had wonderful clinical opportunities for students. And especially if you live in Minnesota and you want to stay in Minnesota, I, you know, it was a wonderful law school to go to. But I, I think what, what this speaks to, again, isn't back to research. You know, you can research on the web different law schools, what some of their specialties are. Again, as Sabrina said, if you see a school, my school was really big in alternative dispute resolution. If that was really something that you wanted to do, man, you should have called me on the phone and said, I want to come in and talk to you because I'm interested in going to law school and I think I'm interested in going to Hamlin Law School because of that program. Mm -hmm. And you want to make that connection if you can. Now I realize right now, COVID life, maybe you can't make that connection, but you could at least make connection online. And some professors will blow you off. Yeah, it's because they, you can't mm -hmm. always be available to everybody, but you can find out where those different specialties are and just help yourself get towards a program that you want want to. And the very top schools may not be at all, even where you'd be comfortable or happy. Um, on the other hand, man, if that's what you really want to do and you want to be a huge big firm lawyer or a law professor, mm -hmm. yes, then you want to go to probably the best school you can get into. Yeah, and I, I, yeah, I think, you know, to if you want to go into a PhD program, you should be thinking about the research productivity of the of the right. university. So, you know, I went to the University of Toronto as well. I went to the Ontario Institute for Studies and Education, and um, it's called OISE. I didn't realize this at the time, but OISE is one of the top 10, um, you know, ranked education schools in the world. Um, 
So I didn't know that. <laughs> and I'm glad I didn't because I probably wouldn't have applied. <laughs> but uh, but but I, I knew that I wanted to have a pathway to a PhD program. So I, I applied as a master's student and then but wanted the pathway. And so um, and I also wanted um, an internationally diverse community. And so that was a, a priority for me. I was studying, you know, as you heard, like I studied um, comparative and international education. And, and I wanted, I was going to be an international student as an American in, in um, Canada and, and, um, and, and yeah, so that was also important. So I was looking at sort of what the quality of the student experience would be as well um, when, in, when I was looking at all of the schools that I was researching. Great, such good information. I want to talk a little bit about the admissions committee. And we also had a question come in that I think ties into that. So from Sarah, she asked, and when Dr. Madden was speaking about work experience, so Sarah had a question about the law school, and she said, is there a strong preference for work experience for those applying to law school? If so, what sorts of jobs are preferred and how many years of work experience? Wow, it, um, hard to give a universal answer to that, Sarah, though it's a fabulous question. Um, I think more and more law schools do like it when there is some work experience because there's just a maturity level that goes into what you're doing in the classroom and what you bring to bear. I know as a professor, it was always really fun if there was like somebody who'd been a paralegal in um, an immigration firm and or a paralegal in a family law firm and they could bring their own real life experience you know into those conversations i don't think it's um you'd know from websites whether schools have a clear preference for that or not i think sometimes it it varies according to what's going on in the larger world and the larger job world and market. Mm -hmm. And when law schools were super scrambling to get students, man, you know, they didn't care much if you had work experience. Um, but I, I think working, and it, it can really just be two or three years, it's really helpful if that, if that work has some tie to the law or, it has some tie to a kind of job that requires problem solving, that requires using analytical skills to do something so that, for instance, when you prepare your personal statement, you can refer to, or when either your boss is maybe one of your recommenders, can say, you know, Sarah worked here for the last two years, we gave her increasingly more difficult work assignments she handled them all beautifully on time with precision i mean all those kinds of things that that could be said very positively um about a work experience is is going to help you just working at the local arby's probably not going to make much difference to to law school and i don't actually mean that as a slam to to anything or any kind of job that right. any kind of job helps you to learn a lot of good things but for law school the the nearest you can come to something that might relate to a legal career right. and it might also tell you maybe you'll decide no, i'm not sure law school is really the way what i what i decided i want to do when i see all of what lawyers are doing. I'm really more interested in public policy. May, may I think I said when we did our planning mm -hmm. meeting, sometimes I wish I had gotten a master's in public administration mm -hmm. rather than a law degree. Not really, but I, I thought that at the beginning of legal practice when I thought, yeah, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> all this research, I sit in the library all day, every day. Um, it, you know, so I think it, the, the fact that you can get some picture that helps you to maybe feed your passion and then be able to express that passion in a personal statement is right. going to be a great advantage. Thank you so much. So Dr. Madden and Sabrina, do you have a um, perspective on the admissions committee and what they're looking for? And Sabrina, you know, I guess for you, like what surprised you about that? You know, you're not on the committee, but what kind of surprised <laughs> you about the process? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think one of the most surprising things, which most master's programs, I, I'm, the, I'm under the impression don't do this, but actually for the monk school, I had to do an interview type and it doesn't, 
like if you do okay in it it's like not a big deal but if you do great like that's stand out but if you do really bad that's bad and so i just remember having to like prepare a lot for it because i was really nervous and it definitely wasn't something that i had expected to actually do at that time but. Yeah, I think um, in terms of thinking about, you know, sitting on committees, um, what we were, you know, part of the thing is to realize it, it really depends on how many applications the committee is getting. So you, ha you have to write in a way that's catching the eye of the reader, right? Um, and then that they can skim it really easily because they might be reading 200 applications at one time. And, and, and so you need to be able to, you need to stand out to them. And and uh, so, so part of it is that you have, you know, that's very well written and grammatically correct, and, but then also it's not too boring. So it's got something spicy or catchy <laughs> at the beginning to sort of catch their interest. Um, but also to understand that, you know, they, they'll have minimum requirements. So um, I'm trying to think, so, you know, at, the, at OISE, uh, at the University of Toronto, um, we had a requirement that you had to have, was it, it was, um, you had to live at least two years out of your home country working. You had to work out of your home country for at least two years or have um, substantial multicultural experiences. And so, um, and, and you need to just write, if you know that those are some of their requirements, then state that as clear, clearly and, uh, you know, as effectively as possible early on. So <laughs> they can read it and be like, yep, check, 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 check. Okay, <laughs> we'll keep on reading yeah. because I know that they've checked off the minimums. And, you know, that was one of the jobs that I had at OISE as I was working as a program administrator. And I'd have to basically go through all of those applications and then only forward the ones on to the faculty members or to the, to the admissions committee um, that met sort of like my vetting process. Um, so it, it, you just look more favorable if you, if you can mm -hmm. write that well. That's great advice. Can, can I say one thing, Carrie, about the yeah. just quantitative aspect of your application? Because um, at least when you're talking about law school, you obviously have to take the LSATs and obviously you'd have undergraduate grades. Yes, what? someone asked a question about that actually. And let me tell you their question because I think you'll answer it, but just so like okay. it's- Okay, oh great. Yeah, so this person said, I'm applying this cycle to law school and there seems to be an over importance of the LSAT at law schools. It's kind of discouraging to find out that if you don't have a certain LSAT score, then there is little or no chance of acceptance. Would you recommend spending most of your time on the LSAT or do you think other parts of your application can have a major impact? Oh boy, <laughs> that's, that's, that's a both and um, yeah. <laughs> answer. So let me take first the, the, it seems like law schools have a cutoff score. Um, that's probably true, sad but true. But that cutoff score is gonna be different at different schools. You know, at Harvard, that cutoff is clearly going to be higher than what it was at my school. Um, but let me tell you why they have that cutoff, at, at, and I'll say it from the standpoint of a school that isn't Harvard. Like it or not, there's been a tremendous amount of research where students who do not score over 150 on the LSATs do not pass the bar. And so law schools take the position that they're doing you a favor. Mm -hmm. If you don't get over that, why, would, why should they take your money for three years or four years when There's they know going in that the chances of you passing the bar are very slim? I know as Christian scientists, we can approach this in a whole different way. So I'm, I'm not doing that obviously with this answer. So that, that's why there's a cutoff. For really prestigious schools, that cutoff is going to be higher. So you have to take the LSAT seriously. But, but the problem with your question, which was a great one, is you really kind of have to take other stuff seriously as well. Um, but, but get that minimum sort of LSAT. And then again, when you're doing your research, you're going to get a sense of what schools might be a reach versus a school that you're really for sure meeting the, the basic minimum. Um, and in terms of grades, it depends. If, if like you didn't do as well as freshman and sophomore, but then you really picked it up and, and did way better as a junior or senior, 
probably your grades from when you did better are going to be looked at with a lot more credibility than than those beginning because there's a lot of students who kind of start out slow you know their freshman year they may be like whoa this is college this is a lot harder than high school um you know so i i think you can temper that people ask about retaking the lsat if you get a bad a bad lsat score that a lot of people do that and if you do at least several points higher that certainly can help you but it's it's not a sure thing mm -hmm. um so it's hard to know what what to suggest in terms of that does that answer the question do you think yeah that, that's wonderful any other tips on the other like on other graduate schools like the gre or the yeah the gre so the gre yeah. is is not there, there isn't as much well the research on the gre is a little bit mixed <laughs> so there you know so um there are many schools who are going test optional especially at the master's level uh, because of, you know, because the GRE um, does have some bias in it in terms of some, mm -hmm. what is more successful on the GRE than others. Uh, that said, you, you know, you need to sort of understand and ask the questions, like go to the admission, the, um, there's plenty of admissions events that typically happen at this time of year um, that are webinars or whatever. I mean, you know, graduate schools are hungry for students right now. And so, uh, if you can get into any of those sort of virtual webinars and ask the question, like, how serious do you take the GRE? Some might say, um, you know, you'll get a good sense. If, if it's really serious, um, they'll just state that. Uh, if they'll say, well, you know, we take a lot of different things into consideration, then you know that it's, you know, not, um, it's not emphasized. Okay, great. I wanted to dig into some of those other things that students are working on right now. So the test scores, we've skimmed over letters of intent, but can we talk about that a little bit? Sabrina, it sounded like you really spent a lot of time on your letter. So I would love to hear kind of just how you approached it and maybe then what else our students should be thinking about from our other guests. Yeah, for sure. I, yeah, I spent a ton of time on my letter of intent because I knew coming in straight from my undergrad, I was already kind of at a disadvantage just because I didn't have that work experience um, in between the years. So I wanted to make sure that my letter in time was like really pristine, no typos, no grammatical errors, like everything was perfect. So, and I tried to make it unique, but also cater towards what they wanted. So I knew I wanted to go into like the global affairs. And so I made sure to say like, I'm a dual citizen and this makes me unique because this and this and this. And then I tried to like, like, use my different experience that I've had, have had at Principia through like the abroad, my au pair and like all of that and really cater towards what I thought they wanted to see. And even me reaching out to the director, they kind of coached me a little in what I should say. So I do recommend reaching out to the schools you want to go to and they'll tell you like, this is what we're looking for. And like to for sure write about that in your letter of intent. And I also just like get it, I got it read over a lot of times by different eyes just to make sure like, I was like, this is what I want to go to. This is what they're looking for. Like, do I exactly like explicitly say that well enough? Any other thoughts? Go ahead, Megan. You, Megan, Megan, you looked like you were about to say something. <laughs> no, no, no I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> I have a little dog sitting next to me and he's like, kind of like talking. So sorry, that's why I'm <laughs> I would um, I would once again say you know Sabrina's answer was so right on um, uh, if you're writing your personal statement for a law school you want yourself to really shine through man I've got a passion for the law um, social justice is obviously a huge issue right now anything that if that's also your passion obviously maybe your passion is tax and tax law that's fine just let that shine through and why how did you come to that why is it is it because you know your mother is a tax lawyer and you've seen what a great career that is and you want to follow in you know those steps or um you see how the law changes society. You can give examples of that and that speaks to you and you know that, that, that for you, you want to be in a profession that does that. Um, I mean, you want that 
I think Sabrina used the word unique when she when she was just talking. You you're you're a really unique individual who has um, interests and skills that this law school wants. Now, if you send that personal statement to law school A that has a tax you know, whatever, mm, you probably don't use the same personal statement when you send it to law school B that has a different, maybe mm -hmm. corporate kind of um, emphasis, but not really a tax program. And that's where, again, your research into um, right. what programs might that law school have that, that you know you'd just be perfect for. You'd just be such a great asset to that law school. Well, and I love that you're all bringing up the uniqueness because I, I can see who the attendees are. And a few of them have been participating in the Thursday night program I've been running. And the first week one, and this will continue to be a theme as we work with all of our students, but finding your unique value proposition. So we've been digging into really figuring out all those experiences that they've had at Principia and maybe even before and outside, but what makes them unique? Uh, how are, you know, whether they're leading their house board or participating in solar car or even a course project that they got so passionate about, you know, some of them, you know, they, maybe they didn't have that law experience, but they did some type of law policy research. Exactly. Or that might have been their capstone. So that we talk about how they can bring that in and then personalizing it, like you said, to whoever they're trying to share that unique value to. You ha You can't just you have to spin it sometimes or find those nuggets to right. customize it based on your audience. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and in graduate programs, it's, it often is all about the professors who are in that program. And so you also need to be aware of who they are and what kind of research they're doing. And it would be a good idea for you to read at least one of each, you know, one article by them, especially if you would like to work with them. So that's another thing in your letter of intent. You could say, that you're interested in working with Dr. Mundy because Dr. Mundy's research on education for all you know, as a global policy, you know, is is attractive to you because you want, you know, to increase girls' education or something like that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but so to identify like that, you know, who's in who's in the program that you're applying to, and, and you know their research. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so important. So what about those letters of recommendation? Um, because those are pretty much asked in most, and I know we have like the teacher perspective. <laughs> so yeah, Dr. Madden also has the unique perspective of, you know, she oversees the faculty at our college that are getting these requests, but then, you know, there's the admissions committee and then Sabrina, I'm sure you asked. And I think I remember you really gave your, your professors some time. Yes, now I'm remembering your story that you shared with Dr. <laughs> <laughs> you gave a lot of time and it came in the night before, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> don't say that. I don't expose people. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, I tried, because I know it's like really important because I applied to three schools and I wanted my, because I was part of the Global Studies program, there were only really two professors I felt really knew me really well for that. And so since they had to write three each for me, I wanted to give them a lot of time. So I actually gave this to them in like October, I believe, and explained like why I wanted to go. And like I sat down and had a conversation so they knew exactly how to like frame my reference. Mm -hmm. So the other thing too is to think about, you know, so just so you all know, I did actually talk about reference letters in the recent Dean's workshop. So faculty have been primed for this, particularly <laughs> this fall. Uh, but part of it was, you know, they're super busy and they, um, and, and it, it really depends on your relationship with them and it depends on how, um, you know, committed they are to making sure that you get into grad school. And so you've got, you know, some are like super excited and they're like, oh yeah, I love the school. I want you to be there. It'd be so great. And they're going to be like, okay, let's meet. I want to read your letter of intent. Give me, you know, um, information about the school, you know, all that stuff. But then you might have others who are like, I'm really busy. I'm writing, you know, 15 reference letters this season. Just give me the information that I need and then I'll just do it. Um, and so it really just kind of depends on, on who you reach out to. 
uh, one of the lessons that I've learned over the years in grad school is that you always have to have a third one or a fourth one, like just have a spare reference <laughs> because you don't want the person who like turns it in at midnight or at 12.05 and then you, you don't get in because the <laughs> reference is late, you know, and so yeah, you should, I mean, I've panicked enough with my own reference letter experiences as a student that I, I always have a spare that's good advice, especially yeah. right now with COVID. Not, I'm not implying that people are not well, but it just seems like there's different family situations that come up and that, um, you know, or, you know, all of a sudden someone is maybe covering for someone else at work or whatever it is. So it's just good to have a backup right now. <laughs> and, and I think you do want to think about um, which, which professors from sort of which classes you might be using. Again, when it relates to law, the fact that there's some problem solving or law connection or big research papers, again, because you do one heck of a lot of research and writing in law school. So having a professor who can speak to your, your skill in those areas is, is of course a good idea. Um, and if you've been out, if you wait a while back to, I think it was Sarah's question about, or maybe somebody else's about working or not. I mean, if you've been out a while, you may feel less comfortable going back to sort of your undergraduate teacher. But I would say for law school, it's still pretty important to have one, one undergraduate reference. So if you're gonna leave print and you know you're gonna go do something else for a while, keep in touch with somebody. <laughs> you know, some good professor that, that you know you have some relationship mm -hmm. now and keep it in your back of your head that you'll ask them for a reference at some point or talk to them about it. Um, so maybe they could give some thought to it even, even now. Right. Be because it's hard for professors when you've got so many different students. Um, and you may want sometimes to just remind them about that incredible paper that they thought was so fabulous. Oh, like, would you like to see that paper again? Uh, I mean, really, there could be ways that you can oh, be helpful true. to your reference person by, by reminding them. I, probably at Prin, that, that doesn't happen in the, in the same way because the student body's so small, but. Mm -hmm. And when you say stay in touch, I mean, I think, it sounds obvious, but I mean, even just tips on that, like maybe sending an email every yep. six to 12 months or just maybe sharing yep. some good news or you read an article and maybe it reminds you of a class or you remind you of that faculty. So just, hey, I saw this, thought of you and. Yes, all of the above. What you mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And not, not in just a total awkward, you know, right. work way. They, right. These can be pretty short emails, especially that your last one about, you know, I saw this article that made me think about what we discussed in class. Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think it's always useful. To, I, never burn a bridge, never br burn a possible helpful, helpful person for later. <laughs> Yeah, we may have to have you back on our networking webinar, <laughs> Professor Mack. <laughs> yeah, that's another one that I have like brewing for some time at some point. Pretty, really critical for everything yeah. you do in life. I mean, I say this, my kids are out of print, whatever, 2009, I guess, and 2000 five is her husband. Um, and I still am always talking to them about networking. It, I think it's, I don't know, this generation doesn't seem to be as keyed into networking as, as mine was, which of course is a really long time ago. But it's, it's very important. Yeah. Well, we have another question that came in and it, we were gonna talk about money and cost. Um, this one is about law school, but I think everyone can kind of maybe answer the money price, you know, the money question, but I'll read the, the, the law school question about money. Um, it's sticker price. So this person says, I found that with my LSAT score, I can get a great scholarship at a top 100 school, but if I'm still in, tw in the 25th percentile in the top 20 schools, if I got accepted to a top 20 school, it seems daunting to take on $200,000 debt when I could get a lot of money to go to a less prestigious one. Mm -hmm. The common phrase is don't pay for law school, but I want 
that name school degree? So like, so it's just <laughs> oh, that that's such a hard question. And I'll be interested in what what Dr. Madden might say to it as well. When I, I mean, I've only been retired for a few years, but lots of friends, their kids would, you know, come and talk to me about going to law school. And I think that my mantra really beca became, don't go into debt, or at least not very much debt. It's not worth it. Law salaries are not exactly shooting through the roof. Now, I'm just so hesitant to say this because I know that you can, as I said at the beginning, the fact that I went to George Washington, I know had an influence on the fact that I went to a huge big law firm and then got a, a job as a law professor. So I know that was an influence, but I just, you, you get basically the same law degree. You don't get the same pristine networking that you might if you were at Harvard, although my understanding from some of my Harvard graduate friends is that their professors aren't nearly as helpful as, as the professors that like were at my school where you know we were incredibly helpful. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm sorry to be so wishy-washy on your excellent question. I'm just at this point in life, with all the unknowns that seem to be going around in the world, I just can't see an advantage that's big enough to go heavily into debt so that you can't even buy your first house after you graduate. I see, I see Dr. Madden is nodding her head yes, but I, I'm super interested in just your perspective of having seen lots more graduate students faced with some of these same problems, I imagine. Yeah, well, and I, you know, I went, I, I, I came from GW, right? So to come to France. So I mean, and I, and I, we were in the higher education administration program. I mean, it was a very expensive degree for students who are going to graduate and not make that much, right? And and that it, it was always for me a, a, a difficult space to be in. Um, uh, we had great benefits for 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 employees for, you know, and so of course I wanted, you know, I was always trying to sell the employees and coming to GW because it was a great deal, but you know, because they got free tuition. But for those who were paying full price or going into debt, um, knowing what their starting salary was going to be after they graduated was, it, it, you know, that's, that's a, it, it was a difficult sell. It's daunting. Them. Ethically, it's daunting. Right? Yeah. And, and so you need to, un, you know, you need to think about like, what kind of degree do, degree do I, you know, if I want to get a master's degree in this, what's the job that I want to have? Or what's the job that I would be qualified afterwards? And how much will I make? Um, that's, you, know, you need to do the return on an investment. And especially if you're going to go into education, I mean, it doesn't pay that much. And so, so like go to a school where you don't have a lot of debt. So you're not strapped to student loans afterwards. But if you're going to, you know, if, if you're going to schools where the starting salary, like if you're going to MBA or something like that, the starting salaries are higher. So then you just need to like do the math, but you really, really, really should do the math. And, and it doesn't hurt to apply to, you know, a, the, the big schools and the, the smaller schools and then get the financial aid packages and then compare your financial aid packages because mm -hmm. you might be surprised, you know, you might. And, and one of the things that I saw when I was at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies is we had students who were coming in and being like, well, so-and-so is giving me 20,000 more. What are you going to do? Right. So there was some part right. that would happen at certain schools. Right. And, and usually miss would be like, okay, we'll give you more money. Right. <laughs> So, I mean, this did not happen at GW, <laughs> but it's well, it, it yeah. definitely happened in Minnesota maybe five years ago when students were scarce. The all the Minnesota schools, the students were absolutely doing that. Well, this school is going to give me ten thousand dollars more, and generally the answer was okay, we'll match that. I mean, so <laughs> doing some of that is possible. The other thing that occurs to me is. Um, I wish I knew more about this, but a, an admissions office could definitely tell you. For in law, sometimes if you want to go into more of a public interest kind of job, there are some fellowships and loan forgiveness, federal government things relating to loans. And I confess, I don't know enough of, 
about it to speak intelligently. But I do know that in reality, the people who would go to a big firm like I did, they're going to make enough money and they'll be able to pay those loans back. The people who go into some kinds of public interest thing may be able to get loan forgiveness. If you just want to be a really solid, fabulous lawyer in your town, um, it, man, don't start out with $200,000 in debt. <laughs> it just takes you so long. And people don't realize that a lot of lawyers don't actually make a lot of money. Um, I, I, I mean, plenty do, but right. that's yeah. not everybody. Right. That's really I don't good. know what those loan forgiveness things are. I could find out, oh, but I just don't remember. I know. Well, actually, I don't know if they're still doing it, but when I got my master's degree quite a while ago, <laughs> um, I got my master's in social work from uh, Washington University in St. Louis, and I got part of my financial aid package was with the Pell Grant. And so then I ended up working as a school social worker, and because um, a percent, a not high enough percentage of our students qualified for the free lunch program. Free lunch. So that's right. I actually had that loan. If, as long as I worked there for five, I mean, every year that I worked there, it cut off, it forgave part of that loan. Right. So I don't know right. If the program is the same or how it's changed, but it's, if it's still alive and out there, it's something to that effect. Right. And I certainly don't, don't mean, I feel like I'm implying, man, you know, don't go to those top law schools. Yeah, I mean, I'm very glad I did. So, um, it, so it's a, maybe a little bit hypocritical. It's just that the, the, the climate, the picture of the job market out there has not been great in the last decade. And I, so I just, obviously the person who asked the question kind of knows this because of the way the question was asked, but um, it, it, it's a really, really tough decision. Well, I think it's a very, and it sounds very personal and you kind of have to, I think that's great advice of apply to several places, uh, get the financial aid packages from all of them. Right. And then you can kind of negotiate or figure out what makes the best sense for you at that point. Yeah, I also want to jump in really fast. I don't have the experience that the previous people talked about, but one thing with UT and I think a couple other schools is like the timing right now is super unique, like being in the midst of COVID. And I know that UT and a couple other master's programs, they did it so that they have COVID relief packages. You don't have to pay as much money with like being online. And then also like we don't have to buy any of our textbooks this semester. Like there's a lot of like ways that COVID has helped with like financial aid in places. So as I was saying before, like just make sure you like look at the school, but there are like different financial aid packages that way too. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Good to know. <laughs> yeah. And I'd also, I'd also like to plug um, Canadian universities <laughs> because they are cheaper. Right? <laughs> so, so much cheaper. So, yeah. So um, even as an international student, it was cheaper for me to go to the University of Toronto than it was for me to go to the University of Minnesota or UCLA, which were my two other oh. choices because I was an out of state student. And so, yeah, U of T was actually a cheaper choice for me, even though they gave me a scholarship. So, I mean, it was like really cheaper, but, um, but still, um, so yeah, I mean, the Canadian schools are good. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> So we have just if you have, so for our guests, if you have any questions, um, please put them in the Q and A. I was going to kind of just ask one final question to our panelists, um, and then let if there's anything we missed, you can jump in. But if we have any underclassmen on our call tonight or that listen to the recording, what advice would you give to them? Like, what should they start thinking about as they journey through their college experience? Um, well, one of the things I think when you're still an undergraduate, if you really are thinking about law school, try to think about the classes you're taking. Um, what, what are the, what are the kinds of classes, whether they're, you know, political science or social theory, or I, I don't obviously know the prim curriculum anymore, but, um, just taking classes that will be demanding that will require research and writing so you'll have good writing samples from what you've done. Um, it, it, internships that you could do that would relate to the law. 
um, volunteer work. If you're really got a social justice bent, um, doing some volunteer work in Alton or you know wherever. I remember doing some stuff in East St. Louis. Oh, so many years ago. Um, uh, talk to lawyers. I guess would be my other. If you're if you're at the freshman sophomore um, level talk to lawyers about what they do on a day-to-day -day basis so that you can just get their best thoughts as well of things that could be helpful for you to do. That's all yeah. I can think of offhand. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, you know, part of it is to really, to, to work really hard to figure out what your focus is. What, what do you want to do? I mean, it's tough at a liberal arts college, everyone's, you know, when I was a liberal arts student, it was like, explore, keep your mind open, especially in your first two years. And I think that's a really good idea. But at some point, you have to be like, what do I want to do? Right? You know, and, and, and write out, you know, I, I journaled. And so I would often like do journaling on who do I want to become? What do I want to do? And you can see in my journals that there was a thread that's pretty much carried me throughout my entire career. Um, and I did an internship that, you know, that leads to what I do now. Um, I was in an, an admissions marketing internship and I was student body president. And, you know, so I, I was doing things related to higher education and related to international ed. I did um, a China abroad Actually, Carrie was my roommate. Right? So, oh my goodness! That's great. So you know, but there are certain things. A hidden secret for those of you that are actually listening, right? Hold <laughs> on. <laughs> yeah. So, so you know, but it, fine. These were things that were naturally attracted to me, and. I didn't quite know where they were taking me, but I was thinking about it a lot and making sure that the courses that I took set me up for some type of graduate experience that I that I knew I wanted. And and so um, that's where if you're you know a sophomore and and or a junior and you're starting to think about whether or not you should go to graduate school, you should really start focusing in on taking classes that are getting you to a place where you wanna be. And even talking to your professors about it, saying, I'm taking this class because I'm interested in doing this when I graduate. And, and I would say on, on my saying about talking to lawyers, again, I, um, even if you look at, um, the, go to the library, I mean, there's, lots of magazines like National Jurist and I don't even know what they're what they all are anymore but they, they they can really help you with all the different types of law that you might be looking at they they often have articles about the you know up and coming um areas of law and then as I said talk to lawyers but but you know talk to a small town kind of lawyer and talk to a lawyer who works in um, the in on the corporate legal department with a big company I mean you know if this is possible Carrie can get you in touch with all these people I'm sure um, and and talk to somebody who's just doing like a, a legal aid or a, a much more of a public interest kind of job I mean you, you want to kind of feel your passion. Like I couldn't feel passion for tax law if my life depended on it. But I certainly know that some people do and, and it, they love it. They just love the intricacy of, of tax law. I mean, so you wanna do kind of what Dr. Madden was saying as you start to focus a little bit more. There's just so many different ways you could use mm -hmm. a law degree. I mean, that. It, maybe I'm being unrealistic by saying, you know, talk to lawyers, but I, I think no, that's that, great that would be a, the, the best way to learn. I wish I had done that before I went to yeah. law school. I didn't. I hardly knew a lawyer when I went to law school, but I knew that lawyers, because I'm, of course, a creature of the 60s, I knew that lawyers are the ones who had changed the world, you know, and that's that was really all I knew. Um, but I it, it would have been helpful to talk to more people about what what they did when they practiced law. Sabrina, do you have any last words of advice, either on that question or just in general, anything we didn't cover? Yeah, I love, I love what you just said, Professor Mahidu. I came in, I came into Prin thinking I was gonna major in business 
and that I never was going to go to grad school because I wanted to be done with school after I finished with print. And, but I found like, you're talking about that passion and I completely changed. I went into global studies and I was like, I want to change the world. Like that was my goal. I was like, I want to do something bigger than like who I am and like get out there. And so I started having, I was like, okay, like this, I can go to like this international school. I can get to know more people, get out there, get to talk to diplomats, get to talk to different people. And that's like when I, really realized that was like maybe halfway through my junior year like at the end of it and then going into senior year and so like honestly my advice like if you're an undergrad like it's okay if you like don't know right now and like you're not sure like you have yeah. time and like just follow like what Professor Mark is saying just like follow what you're passionate about and like see where that takes you and like what you really want to do yeah Wonderful. Well, does any, I, there's no more questions in the chat room. So unless um, Dr. Madden and Professor McAdoo, you have any final pieces of advice that we didn't cover? I don't think so. <laughs> I really appreciate everybody's time and wisdom. I mean, I think um, even the last bit, you know, sharing that advice for underclassmen, I think is so relevant, even for our upperclassmen. Um, as they're thinking through whether they're getting ready to apply now or in a year or two. Um, the chat roll there, we have our guests are saying thank you all so much. This was so helpful. Um, so I know it's a little weird on the webinar because you can't see who is listening, but they are there and <laughs> they've been listening to our conversation and um, really appreciate it. And for those of you that are um, joined us tonight, you can check in with me. I, I do have actually another lawyer that I, that is willing to talk to students and that is currently practicing. Right. So different perspective. Um, so that might be really interesting if you all you know if you're interested in law and want to reach out to me. But um, I'm always here to help with your career questions and grad school. And thank you again to all of our panelists. Great. Thank well, you, Carrie. Yeah, it was great. Thank yeah, you. thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> All, right. All right. Have a great night, everybody. Okay. You too. Bye. Bye. Bye.